Hey, well, I'd like to welcome everyone to the December Western Center for Agricultural Health and Safety Seminar. Um, next slide, please. I'm going to go over a few housekeeping items before we get started. First, this seminar is being recorded. All participants are muted. So throughout this seminar, please feel free to use the chat function to submit questions for the Q&A session at the end of the presentation. Also, as I mentioned earlier, this, um, there is interpretation available in Spanish throughout the seminar. You can choose either English or Spanish from the interp interpretation language selection below. And that's that globe-like icon right at the bottom of your screen. Closed captioning is also available and you can select the CC icon below and click show subtitle. Next. For those of you who maybe haven't joined one of our seminars before, I'm happy to introduce you to the Western Center for Agricultural Health and Safety. Our mission is to improve the health and safety of agricultural workers in the West through innovative research, interactive trainings, and tailored outreach. These seminars are one of the ways that we interact and engage with our um, community partners, with researchers and policy members um, by um, engaging with researchers both here at UC Davis, like Dr. Deep Sosa, and with researchers and community partners across the region. Um, and so without further ado, next slide. I'm really happy to introduce Dr. Deep Sosa, a UC Davis professor, to share with us um, her research entitled So-Called Essential But Treated as Disposable. She's been working with Northern California farm workers um, for a long time, but um, is going to share with us some of her experiences working with them under COVID-19. Um, so with that, I'm going to ask Elizabeth to, to take down our slides and turn it over to you. Thank you so much for being with us here today. We're really excited to hear from you. And you are currently muted. OK, so thank you so much for that introduction. Um, let me see. I want to start with the land acknowledgement. Uh, so we should take a moment to acknowledge the land on which we are gathered for thousands of years. This land has been the home of the Paquin people. Um, today, there are three federally recognized Paquin tribes, the Kachaldihi Band of Winton Indians of the Kalusa Indian community, the Kachaldihi Winton Nation, and the Yochadihi Winton Nation. Um, the Patun people have remained committed to the stewardship of this land over many centuries. It has been cherished and protected as elders have instructed the young through generations. We are honored and grateful to be here today on their traditional lands. And please also, let's take a moment to also acknowledge um, our ancestors and the land from which uh, we all come. Thank you. Um, um, I also would like to do a labor acknowledgement. Um, we also pause to recognize and acknowledge the labor upon which our country, state, and institutions, sorry, I can't even see here, um, are built. We remember that our country is built on the labor of enslaved people who are kidnapped and brought to the US from the African continent and recognize the continued contribution of their survivors. We also acknowledge all immigrant labor, including voluntary, involuntary, traffic, force, and undocumented peoples who contributed to the building of the country and continue to serve within our labor force. We acknowledge all unpaid caregiven labor to the people who contributed this unmeasurable work and their descendants. We acknowledge our, their indelible mark on the space in which we are gathered today. It is our collective responsibility to critically interrogate these histories to repair harm, 
and to honor, protect, and sustain this land. Okay. So, um, as many or all of you know, COVID-19, a pandemic that continues, um, really hit hard our Latinx community and in particular our farm working community. Um, um, and then what is important is that the workplace really emerged as uh, where the transmission of this infection took place. Um, in March 2020, uh, um, outbreaks um, were really uh, terrible, especially in the fields. And that was in particular because of there was no safety. There were no measures for that safety. And uh, this really revealed the inequities in um, the health and labor markets. Um, they were labeled as essential workers, but these essential workers were represented in occupations with really close physical proximity, and they couldn't do the remote work that um, those who were not called essential workers. Um, but as I'm going to present today, they, um, these workers, uh, uh, as the testimonials or the interviews I did reveal, they were treated as disposable. And I argue that is because they work under structural racist capitalism. And, um, and I hope that this contributes to a better understanding of uh, how these farm workers in particular perceive being essential, but the working conditions under which they have to do this labor. So how are they really essential in these times of COVID-19? So um, it won't be a surprise that for those of you who are here, that the Latinx, Latina, Latino workforce is concentrated in two industries, um, the construction and agriculture. Um, they have very low wages, deplorable, deplorable living conditions, is very physically demanding, and they have a lot of occupational hazards. Um, and as a result, um, that they are very difficult to fill. Um, what is that makes it very uh, physically demanding and dangerous is because they're exposed to pesticides, agrochemicals, um, they have low sanitation standards and low wages, uh, despite the hard work that they have to do. Sometimes uh, they work without contracts or legal protections, despite what the law says. Um, and um, because of the low wages, they have to overwork and risk um, getting injuries. Um, few of them have health insurance or get adequate medical treatment. As a result, the pandemic really uh, highlighted the disparities in healthcare as they were getting the highest rates or one of the highest rates of death or mobility and mortality. So I want to show, uh, or uh, as in this um, table, uh, in uh, May of 2020, we can see here the, uh, the population of Latinos and Latinas in California is 41.5%. But the percent of cases of COVID was 59.5, but the percent of deaths was 73.7. Um, um, that compared to whites, that it was the percent of the population in California uh, was 32.5. The percent of cases, 17.8% of deaths, 
8.3. Uh, um, for African Americans, the percent uh, in, in California, 5.9 percent of cases, 5.1 percent of deaths, nine. Um, as of January of the following year, we can see again uh, percent of California population for Latinos, Latinx, forty one point five percent of cases of COVID, fifty seven point six percent of deaths, seventeen point six African Americans, still uh, percent of California population five point nine percent of cases, 3.7, but the percent of deaths, 6.5. Um, the As of March 23, 2022, we can see that the percent of deaths for Latinos and for African Americans, um, uh, as well as for Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders were higher than the percent of the California population. Um, for May 9, 2023, that is the last, um, the last date being recorded, we can see that the percent of, for Latinos, for African American, and for Native Hawaiian is still higher than the percent of their population. So I am arguing that because we are in a society that is ruled by structural racist capitalism, uh, that uh, we see that um, our, this population uh, works under these conditions, and therefore we see um, this kind of uh, events. So um, this study is guided by Ruth Will Wilson Gilmore's definition of racism, that is state-sanctioned production and exploitation of group differentiated vulnerability to premature death. So Latinos, Latinas face capitalist and racist systems that continue to devalue and harm they la their lives. So racial capitalism is a fundamental cause of wealth inequities and racial and ethnic health disparities in morbidity and mortality rates due to COVID-19 in the US. So COVID-19 pandemic put into focus the centrality of racism to the workings of global capitalism. So uh, we can see that there's a disproportionate representation of African and Latino Latina Americans in essential jobs. So between 31% and 33% of African and Latin American workers are in essential jobs. By contrast, 23, 26% of white workers are in those jobs. Okay, so what did I do? I, I as soon as COVID hit, I um, started doing um, interviews, long interviews with farm workers here in Yolo County to see what was their understanding of being at, called an essential worker also about their working conditions, their daily challenges, um, uh, what did they need, and uh, were they getting personal protective equipment or PPEs, and, and um, what were their findings? The findings were that, yes, they considered themselves all but one essential, but they felt that they were treated as disposable. Um, that their employers um, did not really keep their workplace safe or provided PPE. And they all suffered of stress, anxiety, and depression because of having to work and because they could not really address the concerns of bringing the virus home or infecting families 
or their co-workers of loved ones. So uh, on being essential, as I mentioned before, of the 30 interviewed, 29, all but one, said yes to the question, do, uh, do you consider yourself an essential worker? Um, so uh, when answering this, three themes emerge of what does essential worker mean to them. It means working at all costs, the ethical responsibility to be a good worker and being a provider. So what does working at all costs mean? So being an essential worker meant that uh, for 19 of these participants will, meant that they had to sacrifice their health and their lives. As one of them said, right now in this pandemic, most people don't want to go to work. They are afraid to go to work and you have no choice. You have to work. That's why I consider myself an essential worker because we have to go to do the work because if we don't do it, then who would? I mean, it's very complicated. Many people can't. They don't want to go do that work. And well, we have no choice but to go to work. Mia, those are all pseudonyms, by the way. Uh, the other theme that emerged was that essential worker meant that they were good workers. So seven respondents out of the 30 said that they felt it was their duty and social responsibility to perform jobs that other workers declined uh, because they were not willing to expose themselves to the hazard or difficulties of this work. Um, so uh, they were showing strong work ethic uh, without questioning how dangerous or low paying these jobs were. As Jesenia said, that you don't miss work, that even if you don't feel like working or are tired or your bones ache, you have to, you can't stop working. The last theme that emerged was that essential worker meant that you were being a provider. Three farm workers expressed that they felt that they were necessary, important, and needed because they were taking care of, looking after, or sustaining their families, either in the US or in their home countries, or both. This is what Miranda said. I am an essential worker because I have to go to work because I have to support my family. The only farm worker that said that he did not consider himself essential emphasized the temporary and contingent nature of his work. He explained, the simple truth is that I don't think I am essential, an essential worker, because for example, today, I was working moving the boxes of tomatoes to plant and they already laid me off work tomorrow. But from then on, no more explanation than how I'm going to be replaced by other people who have just arrived from Mexico and they will fire you tomorrow. Oh, I don't have a job anymore. This was Don Gabriel. Um, all 30 workers mentioned that a lack of um, protective gear and how they felt that their workplace wasn't safe. Um, 25 of the farm workers, for example, received them from information of how uh, to take care of themselves of preventive measures during an informal workplace meeting but this was a one-time um, informational workplace meeting and they only received a one-time supply of masks 
gloves, and eyeglasses. No more supplies were provided after that meeting, and these farm workers had to purchase their own equipment. And remember, they are low paid workers who had to purchase these masks, gloves, and other PPE. As one of them, Doña Estela said, there was a talk there among the workers themselves about maintaining a certain distance. There they explained to us how many feet we must be from one another and that at all times we must wear the mask that we must not be too close to people. It was the foreman. It was in Spanish, yes, the first time. Only once did he give us masks, gloves, and glasses. Afterwards, we continued to buy the gloves and the masks. So the onus is put on the essential workers, not on their employers, to ensure the safety while they're in the fields. The farm workers who are not paid a living wage are expected to purchase the necessary PPE they need to perform their job safely. The strain might even be worse and even fatal for those five farm workers we interviewed that were not even given safety information or PPE. Such conditions were exemplified in this quote by Don Mateo. No one came in person to give a talk, no. Sometimes we just turn on the TV and see what measures we should take to prevent COVID-19. Regarding the mask, for example, we buy face masks, I buy them. And what they told us was, that they were going to give us some handkerchiefs to cover ourselves, but they never gave them to us. But I don't feel safe enough to say, well, to be able to work, we already bought masks and that's how we'll be able to go to work. I have the one that covers the whole head and after using it, I wash it manually. So I have a new one for the next day. All 30 uh, farm workers really reported feeling stressed and anxious as a result of the difficulties they and their families were experiencing dealing with the global pandemic. That included wage losses, getting sick and self-isolation. This is reflected in the quote by Doña Constanza. I don't sleep. I don't even sleep anymore, really. And I already have times like this, nervous, where I'm a little nervous. I wake up at dawn and I can't sleep anymore. Since the virus appeared, I have been very worried. It's dangerous. So they are aware that there are dangerous times in which they live and work and they are nervous, worried for themselves, for their family members, their children and coworkers. Some of them reported that they experienced anxiety, depression, um, and that especially concern about bringing the virus home and infecting families. And this was echoed in the quote by Don, Don Daniel. Well, one worries about everything that is happening because one does not want to get sick. I wouldn't tell you we are okay. We are frustrated by what is happening, but we can't do anything but be here, taking care of the children who must wash their hands and especially the little one, trying to keep the kids safe. So in conclusion, uh, I think the quotes and, and the stories by these 30 farm workers really reveals how capitalism, that is the wanting to gain profit, structures their lives. They work in an industry really driven by that. The farm workers quote also reveal how racism structures their lives. Farm workers are extro exploited and vulnerable to premature death.
So a theory of structural racist capitalism is needed to explain how Latino, Latina farm workers are highly affected by the increased likelihood of contracting COVID-19. And it is detrimental and potentially lethal. Um, so um, as Powell and Faden argued, the concentration of racially minoritized workers and immigrant workers in a precarious occupation magnify the risk of injustice and thus the peril of poor health outcomes. The utmost precariousness of farm workers is a direct consequence of racialized laws that have been denied basic labor protections to farm workers. So all of the participants, for example, were hired by contractors and were not paid overtime. I think that's all I have. Oops, that was short. Thank you so much. Um, I feel I feel taken back to twenty twenty two, and the the I'm not, I'm guessing that many people here have some of those sem same sensations to the uncertainty and the. Um, the not knowing what, what what is happening around us and the the fear associated with those first months of COVID nineteen, and um, and also remembering that you know I was able to work from home behind a computer um, safe uh, with my kids also in the same home with me and while that was challenging. I did not have to go work in the fields and I did not have that um, uncertainty and threat um, mixed together while I, um, that, that farm workers had. And so thank you for putting all of that, um, that nuance in front of us because it was, it was very tangible. Um, so I, I really appreciate you bringing that to the forefront and um, sharing those those experiences and those stories with us because it's essential that we that we remember these workers during that very specifically hard time um, because it's their lives every day, right? I think you're using the COVID-19 lens, but that's something I'd like us to talk about. Um, but in the meantime, first, I'd like to remember uh, or remind folks to put their questions into the chat box and um, we we can go through them. Um, but, if I may, Heather, yeah, 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 especially because COVID is still going on, yeah, uh, and they just stopped um, taking that measurement. They just, you know, the California Health Department. But as we saw in the last one, still Latinos, Latinas, and some BIPOC communities are still disproportionately represented in, in COVID-19 deaths. That's and right. so it's still going on. Many people are still dying every day of COVID and working conditions still haven't been improved for many essential workers. And so I think it's still vital for us to be advocating for essential essential workers, for low-wage workers in, in many industries, uh, because for many, the pandemic is still something that is impacting their lives. Um, and, um, and for many communities, they're a lot, very at risk uh, because of compounding health conditions, because they haven't had um good health good health care good insurance and so um the risk is because they are immunocompromised because they have diabetes because they haven't had good nutrition so that's why um those comorbidities and and uh, make them more susceptible that's why i wanted to add 
Yeah, no, I appreciate that. And so it does your um your framework for discussing these, you know, for analyzing your interviews and your data, it seems that it holds outside of the COVID specific experience. Um, my sense is that all, you know, the structural racism, the, um, you know, capitalism, et cetera, that, that seems like those, you know, COVID exacerbated what's happening and it highlighted it and so forth. But the, the situation that you're, the case that you're making seems to stand, you know, in your framework without COVID as well. The argument you're making is that is that a fair statement to make? Uh, I think it is a fair statement. Unfortunately, yes. Yeah. So, um, Dr. Pinkerton, the the director of our center, poses the question about. Um, whether you have the sense that workers are getting more training now. So you you know, your interviews happened early on in the pandemic and we're at a different stage now, though it is still ongoing. What's your sense of the training and resources farm workers are getting? So um, it depends of training for what. So if it's uh, for COVID, um, my understanding is that they are not doing it anymore because uh, for many, COVID is a thing of the past. Um, and they believe that if you were already vaccinated once or twice, then you're kind of quote unquote immune. And so um, a few people have gotten vaccinated more than once or twice. They, they're not getting the boosters uh, or not even getting the flu um uh vaccine and so and uh you know i was just in a meeting with local farm workers on sunday we had a meeting with 20 um and uh, again uh, the idea is that they are not getting that kind of training uh, they still use for pesticide training uh old dvd um one in which you know, the con uh, contractor puts that DVD and walks out. Uh, they haven't even um, really updated it. So I think that the idea is what kind of guidance they assume that by them looking at that um, training is enough, uh, assuming that everybody understands and will understand what is presented. Uh, but you know, if you're like me, I watch a video and I have questions, but if nobody is there to answer and make sure that I really understood it, all of the terms, do you really get it? Um, I often don't. Um, and so I think you can learn it when you're dialogue, when you get that back and forth. Um, and not all of the farm workers have finished even primary school. And so can we, you know, we're different kinds of uh, learners. Some of us are visual, some of us are auditory. Um, and so I think that we need to make sure that all of the training and guidance is adjusted for all of that. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's... It is a challenge. I will sort of uh, plug and mention that um, we have the opportunity to be working with the state on the COVID-19 workplace outreach program. And so the state has put a lot of resources over the last few years into funding community-based organizations across the state to do outreach and training, both in statewide. And so there are some organizations in Yolo County, Solano County, who are doing work on the ground. The, the challenge is there's so many more low-wage, vulnerable workers in communities than um, can easily be reached. But, um, you know, to, the, to speak to the workers that you were just recently communicating with, you know, we would love to partner, us at UC Dave, you know, the Western Center would love to partner in trying to reach them with 
better training, right? Because there's absolutely a, a DVD um, that has no interaction that's probably 20 years old <laughs> is not how people learn. Um, and um, there's there's so much room for improvement. And so it, it's, it's connecting with people who are from your community and um, speak the language and can use real um, practical and tangible examples that are, and, and then can learn back from the experts who are doing the work. And that's what I think so rarely is happening is the listening um, from to to the workers about their experiences and and taking that feedback and integrated it into future trainings and future practices. Um, so thank you for sharing your your input from the farm workers because that's it's never good to hear that that's still the way it's happening, but it's not not unfortunately a surprise. Do we have any other questions? I would love to hear, um, if you don't mind, Natalia, about ongoing and other research projects that you might have with the farm worker community, um, you know, whether still on COVID or other topics that are um, relevant to the farm workers in our communities, because you are so deeply ingrained and um, it's so valuable to those of us who care passionately about farm workers. Mm, thank you. So I think one of the things that I, you know, I'm very surprised that the Department of Health, California Department of Health is not, not tracking any more uh, COVID cases. So that's one thing that I, you know, I'm, I'm on alert. So um, one of the things that we have been looking at is um, the impact of COVID, of um, just in general, uh, pesticides and other things on lungs, lung health. And so um, at the behest of the community, they came and said, everybody's talking about uh, how all this affects our lungs, even um, fire and uh, COVID, but we have never learned what our lung health is. And so um, one student, and then I followed up because she graduated, we started doing spirometer tests monthly. That is basically to where um, farm workers get to breathe in, and then exhale. And we followed uh, 10 farm workers, local farm workers, um, uh, monthly. And so we did it for a year to see how their lung health might change um, and if that was impacted by them having um, diabetes or asthma. And we're hoping to be able to get some funding to do that, um, a larger study, because I think that is really important to find out um, and get a better testing that we we got kind of, we borrowed a spirometer. Uh, and I think that, that I think that that's one of the things that I would like, um, the community would like that as well, to learn more about lung health and how it is affected seasonally and with fires and other things. Um, we are also um, trying to uh, develop programs for the youth. I think that that's, um, um, and making sure that um, youth um, have um, uh, an appreciation for the work that their parents are, are doing um, and learn that there are possibilities. I think that they, especially having UC Davis, who is a number one Aggie institution, learning that there is options for them there because we are we constantly hear in our community you have to get away from the fields 
but there are opportunities to work in the fields without having to learn that lesson. And so how can we take that to our communities and tell them, you can go into the field and be a scholar, be an academic. And so we're trying to get that and teach that to our communities and bring them to UC Davis and bring them into the ag fields. Um, and so that's my hope. Um, uh, so that's part of what we envision. I love that. I love I love both of those projects that they both sound amazing. And I love that they are inspired by the communities themselves. Um, thank you for sharing those with us. Thank you for asking. Yeah. Any other questions? I'll have to look through our, our cupboards. Dr. Pinkerton, do we have an extra spirometer? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, well, I just want to thank oh. first the center. Well, Dr. Uh, Pinkerton has his hands raised. Let's <gasps> see if we can. <laughs> Let me ask him to go ahead, Kent. You can unmute. Thank you for a wonderful talk. It was really oh, great to you. hear what you had to say. And it really makes us think very carefully about the, the disparities that exist that we really need to look at uh, for solutions and ways to uh, correct for that. Unfortunately, we don't have a spirometer. I was a pulmonary function technician before I went to graduate school, and the, those spirometers were absolutely amazing. Now they have handheld ones. Uh, hopefully that's something that uh, is available. Uh, it would be interesting to see if uh, we could check with our pulmonary division to see if they do have um, available spirometers um, that that could be used in the future. And again, congratulations on on the projects that you're mm -hmm. doing and and the endeavors that you're doing, especially those that are are mm -hmm. motivated by the community that you're reaching out to. Thank you so much. Uh, coming from you, that means a lot. I you really are a role model, and I appreciate that. Well, thank you again. And as a reminder, we do have our, um, to everyone on the call and to everyone who hopefully will watch this in the future, we do have our small grant program. So Natalia, as um, you know, we'll have to um, make sure that you're on our mailing list for that. We're, we're in the cycle right now, but um, you know, the, the respiratory health and the multiple layered and, you know, Dr. Pinkerton is, is world expert on this, but the layered impacts um, of agricultural uh, exposures that can impact respiratory health is certainly an area of interest to um, the center. And, you know, the the ones that you named off, pesticide, fire, you know, air pollution, all of these directly are relevant to farm workers here in um, in our area. Thank you, Farzane. Um, Dr. Corsandi is our, our lead for the small grant mm -hmm. program. So, um, thank you for putting that up. Well, final final moments for questions for Dr. Deep Sosa. Well, once again, I just really want to thank you for being here. And I hope that personally, I hope that this can be the first of ongoing conversations, because I think that so often a lot of the work that our center is doing is outward facing and not necessarily here in Yolo County as often as it is, you know, down in the Central Valley or on the Central Coast. And um, I know that there's um, so much amazing work already happening here that and we don't we don't want to step on toes, but we would love, love to partner. And um, so it would be amazing to join join forces and, and learn more about the work that you're doing here and see where we can collaborate and join um, and share resources and so forth. It would be my honor. It would be great to collaborate. Wonderful. Especially with Jahi's 
I know her. So it's, I send her your way. So that's great. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Yes, please. I'm always, you know, I always feel so fortunate when amazing students and graduates come from, um, from your department and others. <laughs> Perfect. That's wonderful. Great. It's a win-win. Well, it sure is. Well, I want to thank everyone for joining us today. Um, we are not going to have a January seminar. So so the next seminar we have will be the first Monday of February. Have a wonderful um, winter break and happy new year. And we will see you in 2024. Happy holidays, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.